here's a big nodule shelled out from somewhere. We don't really see much normal tissue around, do we? Mostly fibrous tissue. Yeah, it's been cauterized there at the edge. Oh, there's a nerve. There's a nerve. There. Oh, that's what I wanted to show earlier, how nice that was convenient. Even though it's a bit cooked from the cautery, you can see the, the pink dots in the middle are the axons, and the white space is the area where the myelin used to be. Good. So now over here, I guess let me go back up to lower power again. Inside this big nodule, we've got kind of multiple smaller nodules, right? Packed close together. Lots of big dilated blood vessel spaces. Bands of fibrosis or fibrotic tissue in between. And then going closer to one of these nodules. Tell me, what does this look like to you, or what do you think about when you see cells like this? Because these used to give me a little trouble when I was a trainee. This looks um, neuroendocrine to me. Mm. Um, like a cell ball and look, but here the nests don't have that many cells in them. Yeah. Still it has that... Little, little balls little all balls. packed together. You're right. And that's a great point that a lot of times the those multiple round nest-like structures or balls of cells packed together into a bigger nodule. The Zellbaum look very good for, well, what's the tumor it's classic for? Theochromocytoma. Yeah, theochromocytoma. Or if it's outside of the adrenal, paraganglioma, paraganglioma right? Which are basically, in my thinking, they're the same tumor, although there's different different considerations depending on where they are in the body and, and if there's syndrome associated or not, which we won't go into here because it's more complex than we have time for. But the um, we have time to talk about how cartilage looks um, artistically, but not to go into <laughs> genetics and <laughs> syndromes. All right. Maybe this is uh, my, my problem. Okay. That's where our appreciation of art comes from. Yeah, that's right. We have to have a well-rounded, you know, education. So you're right. This one is kind of interesting because each cell ball, so to speak, is one cell pretty much. It's like a massive giant cell there, not multinuclear giant cell, but I mean a very large cell making up its own little little ball. You're right. But the that same pattern, though, of that closely packing of nests, some people call, say that these uh, like neuroendocrine tubers look kind of organoid because they look like a bunch of like like parenchymal type cells from an organ packed together. I, that never totally worked for me, to be quite honest, because I was always like, what organ? This doesn't look like any organ. So it took me a long time to understand organoid. But I think that's what people mean, is it looks like a bunch of cells packed together with then like stroma in the background. Um, but I, I never really, that never worked with me. I'll tell you what helped me a lot, though. These cells look epithelioid, right? They have round oval nuclei, abundant cytoplasm, and they're kind of arranged in nest-like structures where they're sticking together. And then even in bigger nodules where they're discreetly separated from the surrounding soft tissue. So I used to always struggle when Dr. Rowe would show a case and I'd say, I don't know what this is. Like, it's paraganglioma. And I was like, ah. So what I finally started thinking is if something looks like an epithelial tumor, but it's in a weird soft tissue spot, I would think of paraganglioma. And I started uh, be a, being able to recognize it because of that, because you're dealing with an epithelioid thing outside. Although there are now, I know, of course, there are many other epithelioid looking tumors. But people don't often describe this, I think, as an epithelioid tumor. But to me, it very much cytologically looks epithelioid. So they can have a range of features. The nuclei can be very neuroendocrine looking. This one doesn't strike me particularly that way, like cytologically. Doesn't, I mean, it's a, I guess you could argue it's a little salt and peppery, but I mean, it's not like, it's not like characteristic, uh, classic. Um, also, I think a useful thing to remember is that you can get weird pleomorphism in neuroendocrine tumor. Look how big that guy is. Mm -hmm. And it's like a very like pale nucleus too. Like what the heck? But you can have very large nuclei and pleomorphism. And as far as I understand, that does not predict how the tumor is going to behave. We know a subset of paragangliomas and pheochromocytomas can metastasize and behave in a malignant fashion, but we don't have a good way to predict which ones will. Sometimes based on the site they're at, like I think the ones in the adrenal have a higher tendency to be, to be more aggressive um, than the ones like I think in the, uh, the uh, neck. And this was from the carotid body in the neck. So the so-called glomus jugularis, which is not actually a glomus at all, it is actually a paraganglioma. 
So usually these are diagnosed before operation. They take these out, but they've already diagnosed it based on the clinical and the imaging. And sometimes they'll come out too partially infarcted because they'll have done, you know, some um, uh, injections to try to occlude the blood flow and sclerose it off like um, the interventional radiology and stuff. So in any case, the, the, um, this is a good example, though, of the weirdness that you can see in, in the nuclei. Um, they tend to be positive for neuroendocrine markers, right? The other thing is sometimes people like to do is the S100 to highlight the sustentacular cells, these little smaller mm -hmm. cells that wrap around each of the cell ball. In. And when it works, it looks really pretty. Although I've seen some where it was disappointing, let's say, where mm -hmm. I clearly knew it was perigonglioma. And I was like, let me do it for teaching. And then I thought, well, mm -hmm. it's there, but it's not as, you know, not as beautiful as the books show. The other thing is that usually these are keratin negative but occasionally they can have some keratin and that can become a problem because keratin plus neuroendocrine markers, you start thinking about things like carcinoid tumors or low grade or, or well differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas or neuroendocrine tumors the names have been changed multiple times since I was a resident from other sites of the body you might start thinking about. Now, if it's here on the, the carotid, well, you know that it's gotta make sense to be a paraganglioma, but in other sites in the body, um, in unusual sites, you could really start struggling with thinking, could this be a metastasis? And in fact, one thing that's really important and that thankfully Dr. Weiss mentioned to me one day just during sign out when I was her fellow, and I'm so thankful she did because it saved us in a case in the future. Um, she said that particularly when you get paragangliomas that arise near the sacrum, they tend to have a lot of keratin expression. So they can be strong and diffuse keratin. And I saw one once where the initial pathologist thought that it was actually metastatic um, neuroendocrine carcinoma, like from the lung or somewhere else, and, but it was near the sacrum. And then after, we, after it was reviewed and we looked at it, uh, we figured out that it was actually just a paraganglioma that had a lot of keratin expression. And so that made a big change for the patient, right? It was a primary tumor that was most likely going to be indolent rather than a stage four metastatic tumor. So if, hopefully that'll help you out there. Just remember that sometimes, and I did look after that because I've seen them occasionally at least once or twice at other sites that had some keratin and I did go do a, a, a look in the literature and found that occasionally it's not common but it, it can happen that in other sites even the ones in the in the, the carotid area can sometimes have some keratin expression although the other one I saw was kind of focal it wasn't very much keratin but but so it can happen sometimes so um, and the one other thing I think that you should keep in your differential for these that is not often taught is alveolar soft part sarcoma because they can have cells that are big and round like this and have abundant pale pink cytoplasm. And when they are, the classic ones have big open nests that have are falling apart in the middle of disc cohesive and have that alveolar look. But they often have areas that look very much like this, that look very zell ball in. And especially when you have big cells like this, definitely think about that. And I've seen ones that had very little alveolar architecture and were mostly composed of these little tightly packed nests of large epithelioid cells with pale cytoplasm. I have a video about alveolar soft part sarcoma and also about alveolar rhabdo and how to tell those apart. And, and you can go and compare this and contrast. And I think I show an area in that video, if I recall, that looks a good bit like this. So that was one of those things that if someone told me that I don't remember it, but in practice, I've noticed, wow, that could look a lot like an area of paraganglioma, or that could look a lot like ASPS, alveolar soft part. So, and that's a, a very um, important sarcoma that unfortunately has a pretty bad behavior a lot of times, and it's really important to not miss it. Um, so a good one to know about. So in any case, be aware of that. And you can do additional stains, like those will stain with TFE3, and they should be negative for the neuroendocrine markers and other things that we have here. So um, there's paraganglioma. And I don't think this one has any ablative stuff. Sometimes you can actually see the ablation material in it. It depends on what they've used. I think there's different mm -hmm. different approaches. And you shouldn't biopsy one of these because it bleeds a lot. Yes, and I think the some paragangliomas um, are secreting, right? They secrete catecholamines, although my understanding is that that's the ones in the carotid don't tend to do that as much. It's more like the adrenal ones. But also, I think if you if you go mess around with them, sometimes they can dump the catecholamines in, in the ones elsewhere in the body, and that can become a real you know people can have like really serious problems from the catecholamines. So, all right. Well, I think that brings us to the end. Thank you so much for doing this with me, Fatima. My pleasure. And thank you at home for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Have a nice day. <laughs>